Okay. Oh, yeah, I didn't realize it wasn't on. Okay, this is Franny Preston, and she's going to be giving the talk today. And she is the Invasive Species Outreach Coordinator at the University of Kentucky. And she's developing a program to teach others about invasive plant, um, teach others about invasive plant education. Along with outreach and education, she's working with Jason Brown and the Kentucky Invasive Plate plant cancel to update Kentucky's invasive plant list. She has a background in wildlife education with a BS in wildlife biology and conservation education from Murray State University. And she loves to learn and teach how plants function in eco within ecosystems. And so now we'll have Fanny come up. You don't need the step no. stool, do you? I'm okay. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Pat, for the introduction, and thank you all for coming today to learn all about invasive plants. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about a few different broad topics about invasive plants, kind of covering everything. I'm not sure what everyone's background knowledge is on invasive plants. Maybe you take care of the ones in your yard. Maybe you volunteered at parks or other natural areas as well. Um, but we're going to kind of be covering a bunch of topics today and then afterwards taking a few minutes to go outside and actually look at some. So we'll start with actually figuring out what invasive plants are. Because you might hear the term invasive plant used in a bunch of different contexts and it might mean different things to different people. So we're going to kind of clarify that so we all know what we're talking about. But we'll start with talking about what native plants are. And I have the lengthy definition up here. A native plant is a plant that is a part of the balance of nature that has developed over hundreds or thousands of years in a particular region or ecosystem. Okay, so two things to take away from that is that native plants are originally from the area and they have their niche, which just means their role in the environment. I have pictured one of my favorite native plants that's called a button bush. They like to grow along waterways and they are really good plants for pollinators and also a lot of wildlife, including waterfowl. All right, and now the opposite of native plants are non-native plants, pretty easy definition to remember. But non-native species are organisms that do not occur naturally in an area, but are introduced as the result of deliberate or accidental human activities. So non-native plants are not originally from the area. For this um, presentation, we can just focus on Kentucky. They're not native to Kentucky, but they're not necessarily bad. So some of my favorite garden flowers are tulips. They remind me of my grandma's garden. Those are not native to Kentucky, but they're not causing any problems. They might not have their niche in the environment. They might not be supporting pollinators the way native plants do, but they're not really doing any harm. Now, there are non-native plants that are doing harm, and those are what we call invasive plants. Invasive species are organisms that are non-native, they're introduced, they can be diseases, parasites, plants, or animals, that begin to spread or expand its range from the site of its original introduction, and that has the potential or is causing harm to the environment, the economy, or human health, and most of the time, all three. So to take away from that, invasive plants are non-native and they are causing harm. And I have here Lespedeza, which you'll find in fields and roadsides a lot. And I have pictured some common invasive plants in Kentucky. Starting from the left, we've got winter creeper, which you're going to find in your urban settings. You'll probably find some on the church property as well. There's a ton of it behind the apartment that I live in. We've got kudzu, which it's making its way northern, more northern and eastern. Um, where I've lived in western Kentucky for the past four years, it's everywhere. Um, I'm sure you all are very familiar with kudzu. And then porcelain berry has these really beautiful berries, of course, as the name implies. And I actually took that picture on the very right at McConnell Springs Park. So they are kind of everywhere as well. Look for those on the edges of parking lots, the edges of the roads, and in thickets. 
All right, so you might have heard the term invasive plant. You might have heard that in a different context. Remember, it's non-native and it's causing harm, but you might hear some people refer to weeds as invasive plants. This can be a little bit tricky, so we're gonna talk about what is a weed. Well, just like all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares, all invasive plants are weeds, but not all weeds are invasive plants. So what is a weed? Well, it's unwanted, it's undesirable, and it can be considered a plant out of place. Now this, of course, can be very subjective. So what plant belongs where depends on each person. So we even have some native species that people might consider weedy in their gardens or maybe in their crop fields. Um, I have a native milkweed right here called butterfly weed. Of course, it's native, so it's supposed to be here. It has its niche. It's very great for a lot of different pollinators, but it has a really strong growth habit, and so some people might consider it a weed, which is totally okay. If you don't want it in your yard, that's your yard, that's your landscaping. I love promoting native plants, but um, that's just one example of a native species that could be considered a weed. I like to give this example of knotweed. Now, knotweed, if you haven't heard about it before, is an invasive species, so it is a weed. And when you're looking at the word, it's great, it makes sense, but I've been part of very confusing conversations before when people are talking about knotweed, because they're like, what do you mean knotweed? It is a weed. I took this one at a park in Versailles, so that's, there's a bunch of it there. And it reminded me of my favorite clip from Winnie the Pooh. If you guys can see that up there, it's a very confusing conversation about knots that he's trying to have with Piglet. I love the English language, don't you all? <laughs> all right, so now that we know what invasive plants are, they're non-native and they're causing harm, let's talk about the harm that they're causing. So invasive plants, they cause a lot of harm to the environment, which I'm sure a lot of you all care about, um, being part of the green chalice, and they also cause harm to us. One of the ways that they cause harm to the environment is that they can mess up nutrient dynamics in an ecosystem. And this can look like messing up the nitrogen cycles and carbon cycles, which of course messes everything up because that's where a lot of the energy comes from messes up succession, which is basically how an ecosystem develops. Um, you can, a good example of succession is if you have a bare volcanic island, it's gonna think about the plants that grow first and then they get bigger and then they get bigger. Well, invasive plants, they'll come in and take over maybe a field area, a prairie area, and they'll cover it way too quickly or they'll slow succession. They might make it quicker. It kind of just depends on the species. They mess up the water cycle um, and hydrology. Some of them might cause erosion because they don't have as much roots in the ground as some native plants. They might uptake more water. They might uptake less water. They're not acting the same in the ecosystem as the native plants. Um, kind of in the same vein, they can mess up fire regimes. So I'm not sure if you all are familiar with prescribed fires, but that's a management tool that people use to kind of um, keep the ecosystem healthy and keep succession happening. And when invasive plants are there, you think about how bush honeysuckle grows. It's gonna increase the height of the lower level plants in the forest. And so when fires are started, it's gonna make the fire go to the canopy like it's not supposed to and kind of create some management issues as well. And this also, of course, takes place on naturally occurring fires too. They can really inhibit regeneration, which we'll talk a little bit more about with native plants, um, but it's really difficult for smaller native plants or even bigger ones to grow if the whole landscape is covered with invasive species. And they mess up soil characteristics as well. So like I said, they can uh, mess up the nutrient cycles and they can mess up erosion and change pretty much all of the microclimate of the soil. So what are some harm to our favorite native plants? I've got common milkweed on the left and then um, a coneflower on the right. Well, native plants, um, I'm sure if you all have ever seen like a native pollinator garden, like the one you're starting out here, maybe you've seen a, a field in the wild, you, you see a lot of diversity. We call that biodiversity. And when invasive plants come in, the way that they grow is they create dense monocultures. So they want it to only be about themselves. And this wipes out any biodiversity of native plants. 
One of the reasons that they can do this is because they tend to bloom and leaf earlier than native plants in the season and then also later. It's why in the winter time in Kentucky, all of the greenery that you see is most likely going to be an invasive plant. So because they can do that, they're getting more energy at different times of the year and they're able to grow better than native plants. They can exhibit allelopathy and this just means they're kind of sending bad chemicals through their roots that are killing the native plants around them. There are some native plants that do this as well. Black walnuts do that, um, but they have their place in the ecosystem. The invasive plants don't, so there's too many of them. They're killing all the native plants. Um, when they change the soil components, that of course can affect how the native plants can grow if they need a certain acidity in the soil. And like I said, they can alter succession. Now, because they're affecting the native plants, they're affecting the native wildlife as well. It can reduce the food resources for the wildlife. It upsets the food webs. It alters habitat, especially for smaller species. And it can even change waterways. It can make waterways harder to access for wildlife, or it's taking up all the water, and then they might not have a water source they normally do. All right, so what about in our gardens? Let's talk about us now. <laughs> Invasive plants, while a lot of them were brought over for ornamental reasons to be planted in gardens um, or different landscaping, they really don't do well in gardens a lot of the time, especially if you have a really big yard or if you live right next to a natural area. They can get really messy. They're really good at growing, and so they're just going to take over. It's going to be a lot of headache for you as well. Um, they're very good at wandering around and escaping. And I have pictured some mimosa trees on the top and then some different invasive mulberries on the bottom. It's a mimosa tree. Mm -hmm. They can grow pretty tall, but a lot of times they'll also be kind of shrubbier. So that's the picture I included, just to show what it looks like when it can kind of get messy. What about agriculture? So we've got some really important crops in Kentucky that we grow. And these invasive plants can actually reduce crop yields. They uptake fertilizer and water that the crops need. They, again, they can exhibit allelopathy, so they might just be killing the plants. They create monocultures and pastures, which can really hurt the livestock because it might be okay, some of the plants might be okay if the cows are eating it sometimes or the horses are eating it sometimes, but if it's the only thing in the field, that's gonna cause some health issues. And some of them might even be toxic to livestock, like poison hemlock. And they create long-lasting seed banks. So this is really difficult, especially when we're trying to do more environmentally friendly farming, where maybe you're letting a field fallow for a little bit, you're rotating crops, because these invasive species, they'll have seed banks in there, and so then they're going to grow up while we're trying to let the field rest. They can also really harm our um, recreation. So ecosystem services, if you're not familiar with that term, it's basically what does the ecosystem, what does the environment provide to us? This can be a whole host of different things. Um, but one of them is recreation. I don't know if any of you all like to go hiking or kayaking, things like that. Um, but invasive plants can actually harm, harm that. They can ruin the aesthetic of different recreational areas. Um, imagine if our national parks are just overtaken by invasive plants, how sad that's going to be. They can even make people want to use these green spaces less. Maybe it's more difficult to hike through the woods or because it doesn't look as beautiful, people don't want to go hiking anymore and then they're not supporting these natural areas. Um, along with that, they're not willing to pay to go to these areas as well. They might even make places less accessible, um, like they do for wildlife, they might make waterways less accessible. Um, a big factor of that is aquatic invasive plants. So um, I don't know if you all have ever tried to kayak through, what's it called? Um, in some Western Kentucky lakes, there's this aquatic invasive plant called Eurasian milfoil, and it kind of just grows up like seaweed, and it's so hard to kayak through. And it's uh, ruining the environment as well. Invasive plants also have some economic impacts um, outside of just the recreation and agriculture but they cost the United States over $26 billion annually. Kudzu, when we were talking about a little bit earlier, um, causes 35 or 350 million annually in lost, just lost timber. 
and then 1.5 million annually and just removing it from the power lines. For our homes, they can cause damage. And I've heard some people say that even when they're trying to sell their houses, um, the invasive species on the property have actually lowered their property values because of how the property looks. I have some Bradford pear trees, which I'm sure you all know a whole lot about. They're all over our cities and roadsides. And Bradford pear trees are really notorious for once they get big enough, one windstorm hits and then their branches just snap because they kind of grow like this and then they just snap over and ruin our cars and homes. This is an interesting one that um, people might not think about a whole lot, but invasive species are actually detrimental to our health as well. So some of them, like poison hemlock, they are toxic to ingest and toxic to touch. Um, this was an interesting one I actually learned while I was making this presentation, but they can actually contaminate honey um, and make honey a little bit toxic if that's the only plant that the bees have to go to and it's a, one of the to more toxic species then it can actually contaminate honey as well, which is also making the honey producers lose money. And they can contain allergens too, which is never fun. And one that they're notorious for is they increase ticks, especially with, um, you know, ticks like to live in brambles and really brushy places. And a lot of these invasive plants grow like that. So they're increasing ticks, which really has an impact on our health. And they can actually cause a decline in mental health too, because People, you know, their mental health is boosted when they go visit these natural areas. We have these places to connect with nature. And then when the invasive plants are harming them, it causes a decline in mental health too. Um, a famous example of an invasive plant causing harm to human health is Socrates. Now, poison hemlock is not invasive over there, but it's a good example. Socrates, when he was executed, was actually made to drink um, a drink made out of poison hemlock. So that one was a bit interesting bit of history for you. Hey, can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Since the poison hemlock is poisonous, is there a variety of knockoffs? I don't believe so. I haven't read anything about that. Okay. And a lot of them in that family, I think it's I think that they're in the carrot family or the parsnip family. And so there's a lot of plants that look like them too. Um, and a lot of them are actually toxic. Maybe not as toxic as poison hemlock, but they still are toxic to touch as well. Yeah. Best to stay away. Yes, best just to stay away. If you have any inclination that's poison hemlock, just don't touch it. So, yeah. I don't know specifically about wild carrot. I think that there's some that are fine to eat. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think Queen Anne's lace is toxic, mm -hmm. but I'd have to double check on that one. I think it just depends on the species. Yeah, feel free to ask questions at any point. I should have said that at the beginning. So what do we do about this? I've talked about all of the problems that invasive plants are causing. Well, one of the best ways that you can help with invasive plant research and management is by monitoring. How many of you all have used iNaturalist or heard of iNaturalist before? Okay, a few of you. How many of you have smartphones? Great, all right. Uh, um, so iNaturalist, if you don't have a smartphone, that's okay too. You can use the website, but iNaturalist is an app that you can get. If you don't have it, download it right away. Um, you can also just use the website. And what you can do is you can, when you are out and about, you can actually take pictures of any plant or animal that you see. Take a picture of it. It'll ID it for you with some AI um, technology, and you can post it. And especially when you're doing the invasive plants, um, that actually helps me and um, the other people working on the relisting Kentucky's invasive plants because we can actually see their distribution. Because if there's people all across the state, all across the country, posting where these plants are, that just helps get a better view of their distribution. It's also really fun um, to use iNaturalist because you learn a whole lot of different things as well. Um, if you want a quick, iNaturalist also has an app called Seek that I like to use. It works without internet. I used it in Australia. Like, it, it works everywhere. Um, and it just quickly helps you identify things as well. There are. Mm -hmm. iNaturalist is one of the biggest ones. Um, and so it has one of the biggest databases and works well because of that. But you're right, there's a lot of them. And there's some that are specific for trees or specific for birds as well. Things like that. 
Mm -hmm. Yep, that one's good too. Um, another one is EdMaps. Um, now this one is a little bit more um, technical and has you include a lot of information when you're reporting these species, but it's also a good one to use as well. Um, and EdMaps is just for invasive species and you can actually post pictures the same as you can um, on iNaturalist and you include a bunch of information and then a professional will review the information and see if it's a good posting and then that goes into a database as well. Yes. with the other sightings? No, everyone, unless you have it on private, which you are free to do if you are just using it to learn your plants or something, um, every posting that you do, other people can view. So um, sometimes if I'm look, trying to look up how maybe how prolific a plant is in the state or in a certain region of Kentucky, I'll get on the iNaturalist and let's say each of you posted um, a different picture of honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, I can get on there and see all of those. Did you have a question? Okay. Oh, you do have to post it, yes. But once you click save or post observation, I can't remember what it says, then it's on there. Yeah. We, I mean, I haven't heard of any um, with that. People using iNaturalist are using it for biodiversity. Now, if you want to post it, but you don't want people to know the location, you can also do that as well. Um, sometimes when I find maybe cool salamanders or something, I don't want people to know where they are. <laughs> And so I will post the picture that way people, and I can even just say, oh, this is in Kentucky, um, or maybe make it a big region so people can know where it is, but not know specifically where it is. So um, that's pretty easy to do as well. I think you can just click off, like X out the location or make it a private observation as well. Yeah, but if that's something you're concerned about, you can totally do that too. It does defeat that purpose, but also it's just a great app to learn your plants and to help contribute to your own knowledge too. So it's good for a whole bunch of different things. All right, so we talked about monitoring them and those is um, the best way to do that, um, in my opinion, is iNaturalist. Um, but how do we actually control them? This, of course, is going to vary per species. We'll talk about a couple of different species and their control methods. But you've kind of got two options with invasive plants. You've got physical control, and this can be hand pulling, chainsaw, loppers, pruners, or mowing, kind of depending on the species. And then you've got chemical control. And these I know these can be a little bit controversial. Unfortunately, with a lot of invasive plants, this might be our only option to actually tackle them. Um, but when you are, if you are using herbicides, try and get some that are low persistence so they don't hang around for a really long time. They just do their job and then um, kind of degrade. There's, if you have children running around your yard or pets, just make sure that that herbicide is safe for exposure, kind of keep them away from that area. And then it's best if you can use herbicides that are target specific. Um, it should say, and you'll, once you, if you're trying to research what herbicides to use, you can find that information pretty easily whether it's just gonna kill the plant that you touched or whether it's gonna kill all of them around it as well. So we'll talk about a couple that are here um, and that you probably have in your backyards too. I know that we have them in my backyard. <laughs> um, one of which is English ivy. This is a really easy one to spot. Um, it's the ivy that was planted for ornamental purposes and you can find it all over, especially in urban areas. With English ivy, depending on how big the infestation is, that's kind of going to determine what your control method is. You can just hand pull it. Um, if there's climbing vines, you kind of want to take care of those first because those are the ones that are going to seed and fruit and the birds are going to eat it and spread it. So if you have English ivy in your yard or another place you're trying to control, try and get rid of those climbing vines first. Um, you can just use a knife or a screwdriver even to kind of pry those off. 
You can dig up the roots. You want to try and get the whole plant when you do it. Otherwise, it'll just re-sprout. And then herbicides can be used for that as well. Now, um, one thing that Pat and I were talking about that is really great for invasive species control is finding an alternative to plant instead. If you can find a native alternative, that is great because then you're kind of adding a puzzle piece to the bigger ecosystem, restoring that. But if you're trying to find an alternative, try and find at least a non-invasive one. And these, I all, I, all the ones I pictured are native to Kentucky and can grow in this area. But the reason that we want to find an alternative is because if we rip up all of the English, English ivy in an area and then don't plant anything, it's going to come right back. Um, it's got seed banks, it's got some little root structures that we might have missed and they can just grow right back. But some, yes? Um, the invasive plants, when you're trying to, of course, plant the native alternatives, you're right, they can choke it out. So that's just kind of something that you've got to like constantly, every year, every maybe a couple times a year. What'd you say? Will the native plants, once they get a good growth, um, good growing happen, then it should be able to um, help reduce the invasive plants. You kind of have, it's really hard to manage for, but if you're constantly working at it, then you can absolutely create um, native alternatives where they'll take over. Yes, so the one on the left, this one is one of my favorite. There's a lot of different phlox species that you'll find native in Kentucky, and creeping phlox, um, it's got a couple different words, but that's um, it's one of my favorite. It has really beautiful flowers, and that one grows, takes over like a ground cover just like English ivy does, so that's a really good one. Um, and then the bottom, I just showed the website that I got it from, so that's not the same thing for you. But I got it from gardenia.net. Um, so that first one is creeping phlox is a good alternative. And then another one is wild ginger. I got this picture off of wildflower.org. And wild ginger is another one that has that ground cover that can take over pretty well. It grows best in shady areas. Now this one is not going to be evergreen like the English ivy is. So it's good to, especially in the winter, make sure you're controlling the English ivy while it's kind of dying back for the season. And then another one is stone flower, and this one kind of gets a little bit taller than the other two. Um, and I found information for that on the Tennessee Kentucky Plant Office. That's a good website as well. That one also creates a ground cover, but it gets a little bit taller than the other two. Oh, good. <laughs> I think he was asking a question really quick. <laughs> Sorry about that, that's okay. Um, your question was, how did they get into your yard? You said you might have all of these three. Well, that's gr that's great. Yeah, that's great that you have them. Of course, they're spread like any other plant. They could be spread by birds, or depending on them, they might have wind dispersed seeds, things like that. Yeah, they do. <laughs> and some and these grow really well too, which is why they're good alternatives to English ivy. Now we've got burning bush. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Burning bush. Okay. I had to put this one in here. I'm sorry, guys. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, they are really beautiful plants, um, and they're used in landscaping a lot. Um, unfortunately, they are extremely invasive and causing issues when they escape from the natural areas. Okay, well, that's good. Yeah, that's good that you have that variety. Um, but if you do have burning bush in your yard, and it is most of the time they are going to be invasive varieties, um, those are a lot of them. Where they were planted in landscaping, especially in the 70s. Um, we've got a ton of them out here, but they, they grow everywhere. You're going to see them on roadsides. You're going to see them in the understory of forests, and you're going to see them in people's yards. I was telling my mom about burning bush, and she's like, come look at our neighbor's yard. She's got such beautiful ones. I know. I know they're pretty, but um, they unfortunately don't just stay in our yards a lot of the time. Um, the bird, They've got really tasty fruits for the birds. They don't provide nutritional value for the birds as much as native species do, but the birds still eat them and spread them. Um, so if you are looking to find an alternative for the burning bush, um, you want to remove it first, obviously. You can hand pull them depending on the size, shovel or reed wrench as well. If you're not familiar with reed wrench, I've used these to remove bush honeysuckle before. They're pretty great because I don't have a lot of manpower, but you can just kind of, they have like a little wrench that you clasp around the um, bottom of the plant and you can like use it as a lever to pull it up. Um, again with burning bush, and this one can be a little bit trickier, but you want to try and remove the entire plant. Um, and this is going to uh, be a plant that definitely re requires repeated cutting. Um, and that's a good way to kind of kill it back too, is if you're just constantly cutting it, then it'll eventually lose its energy. So if you are trying to find an alternative for burning bush, this is actually one that it has a little bit easier of a native alternative because its, it's genus name is called Euonymus. Um, and there are some native Euonymus species, one of which is strawberry bush. And it's also called hearts of Burston. You might have also heard of one called Eastern Wahoo. And these are very closely related to burning bush and they have very similar fruits and flowers. They do grow a little bit more sparse than the burning bush themselves. But other than that, they look pretty much the same. So those are really great ones. There's some planted in the Arboretum at UK if you ever wanted to go look at some. Um, and their fruits look really cool this winter. So that's a really good one that's almost a direct alternative because they are so closely related. Um, another one, if you've never smelled Virginia sweet spire before, this is one of my absolute favorite plants. It is a native shrub. Um, it grows, I, I've seen one grow and it grows really shrubby and thick just like a burning bush would. It attracts a lot of pollinators. I think it's really good for birds as well and it smells so good. So it's one of my favorite alternatives. And then there's some viburnum species as well. And a lot of these will grow shrubby and work as great alternatives. Um, the one I have pictured here is arrowwood viburnum. So that might be a good option as well. Now, if you are looking for some different resources, or maybe you have a question about a specific one, feel free to email me about it. But if you're trying to find resources to take care of the invasives in your yard, you can take a picture of this right now, or of course, um, this presentation will be shared. But I like to use, when I'm trying to figure out what the management is for a specific species, you've got a few different options. Google is your best option. But there's um, a management guide for invasive plants in southern forests. There's a Kentucky Woodlands magazine that UK puts out, and that um, actually has a lot of stuff about invasive plants sometimes. And then a good resource is the Kentucky Invasive Plant Council's website, and they can actually show you links, and then also the Kentucky Native Plant Society's website. They have links to find native alternatives or for management guides and things like that. And I know Pat mentioned that some of you really might like some volunteer opportunities to help tackle invasive plants in your community. Um, one of, a good one is that at, on Thursdays, 10 to 12, almost every week, at the UK Arboretum, there is a group of people that, they do a whole bunch of different management for the Arboretum. Sometimes it's spreading mulch, sometimes um, it's killing invasive plants. Um, so that's a really good group if you wanna get involved and are free on Thursdays. Um, UK will be putting on some weed wrangle events in different areas around the state, but definitely in central Kentucky as well. We don't have any dates planned for that yet, but if you're interested, you can always shoot me an email and I'll put you on the list to be the first to know. 
And then on wildones.org for the Lexington chapter, they actually have a really cool calendar in different parks will, in different nature preserves, will put different events that they have on their calendar that people can volunteer at. So check out their website as well. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and if you all are inv interested in maybe being an educator and teaching other people about invasive plants, We've actually got some workshops going on. The one for Fayette County is March 19th. Um, if you've got a smartphone, you can scan that. Again, you can also just shoot me an email and say that you're interested in that. Um, maybe you've had experience with managing invasive plants. Maybe you've had experience with environmental education and you want to combine them and put on your own programs, but you're not really sure how. Um, these are what these workshops are for as well. All right, and if you all have any final questions, I appreciate you all learning today about the invasive plants. Yes. What were the uh, major species of silver birds? Is that the thing you did in the house now? Mm -hmm. And then what is what was the fate of the human? That's a great, that's a very great question. Um, so depending on the plant and where you are and what the timing looks like, maybe you've got a pretty big backyard and you've just cut a bunch, uh, you've just pulled a bunch of winter creeper up. One thing that you can do, especially in the summertime, is put a big tarp down and then just let, put all of like the clippings and trimmings on that tarp and it'll bake in the sun, let it out there for as long as you can, but at least a few days until it's all dried up. Um, and then you can compost it. If you compost it before, as you can imagine, it's not gonna work out because it's just gonna grow there. So that's one way to do it. If you, that's not an option, you can just throw it into a landfill, which sounds bad, but at least it's putting it somewhere where it's not going to grow and overtake the environment. Um, some species, you can even bury them really, really deep. Um, that can be really tricky because you have to bury them pretty deep. Um, so the tarp method, that's one I've used before for even bush honeysuckle. You just lay them on the tarp and let them dry out for a really long time, and then you can compost them that creates habitat for rabbits and stuff as well. Burning, burning them, um, that, that is an option. Um, you wanna make sure that it's not one that has seeds or anything that's going to like float away, um, but burning them is an option as well. heard about those, but if they're taking them to compost, it's probably best to not put them in there. If there's something with seeds on it, though, um, that you uh, like can visibly see, you do want to just kind of throw it away. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the best option is just send it to a landfill. Yeah. Anyone have any other questions? It's a great question. Yes. I've been once. Mm -hmm. I think Bernheim might do native plant sales sometimes too. There are some nurseries around here that do sell native plants. Some parks and different groups will sell them as well. Yes. That's a good question. It's one that can be asked about a lot of our invasive plants. Unfortunately, there's a lot of them. We're probably not going to be able to get rid of them completely ever 
just because of how um, how prolific they've become. Kudzu might be one, um, bush honeysuckle, that as well. But every little bit that you can get rid of does help. Um, Kudzu is a tricky one, but that one is one that definitely has to be focused on because it will, I mean, a lot of these plants, they might be shrubby, so they'll be blocking out the native plants underneath, but kudzu will grow over top of canopies, and so it's wiping out whole forest sections. So basically, we've just got to be hopeful and do what we can, um, and maybe we can create a city that doesn't have any invasive plants in it. We're probably not going to be able to get rid of them entirely, um, but like I said, every little bit helps. Mm -hmm. Yes? And that's the one that's a vine honeysuckle. You'll see that as well. It's kind of got glossy leaves, and you'll see that growing. Um, and then the bush honeysuckle is the one. It's not always huge, a huge tree, but a lot of times it is. And uh, both of those have those flowers that we all do. They grow them. Yes? All the native honeysuckles. There are native honeysuckles as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. What about some of the other honeysuckles? There is coral honeysuckle. I'm trying to think of some of the other species. I don't know them off the top of my head, but there are some native ones that are really good to replace the invasive ones too because they also grow pretty well. Um, I think most of the native ones are vine native honeysuckles. I did see one last year, but I'd have to double check on that. And some of those are really pretty too because um, the native coral honeysuckle, that one's just the hummingbird, it's got that cage shape and it's just really pretty. Absolutely, yep. iNaturalist works pretty well most of the time. Now there might be some times that it doesn't give you the exact right answer and you want to try and take a couple different pictures instead. I noticed some of the native honeysuckles are really pretty and they have the little flowers. Mm -hmm. Yep, and then there's some more native honeysuckles that are really not so pretty. Sometimes not, yep. <laughs> All right. Anyone have any more questions? I appreciate you all learning about this today, and for I know you all are tackling invasive species as well. So if you all want to, um, Pat's going to help me out at this because I have a really bad memory of where things are, but we're just going to go look at a couple of the invasive species that we have on the property. Yeah, thankfully it's beautiful outside. I was a little bit worried. <laughs> oh, also, before I forget, um, I brought 